It has been the greatest honour of my life to serve our country as Prime Minister over these last six years and to serve as leader of my party for almost 11 years. And as we leave for the last time, my only wish is continued success for this great country that I love so very much. Thank you. David Cameron embraces uh, Samantha and the three children on the threshold of uh, 10 Downing Street. Applause from the staff and the colleagues who have been with him for the last six years. And Mr Cameron defined his legacy in his own terms and set out his achievements as he would like them to be seen. And so the children make their way into one of the cars as Mr Cameron one last look along Downing Street at the mass ranks of the media here, but more importantly for him, at all of his friends and colleagues and staff who are wishing them well as they embark on the next phase of their lives. So for the last time, into the Prime Ministerial car. Mr Cameron glances again along Downing Street. Acknowledges the applause fully aware of the import of this occasion and what it means for him, the end of his premiership after six years, in circumstances that he would never have wished. And the Prime Ministerial cavalcade now making its way down along Downing Street and some crowds gathered at the uh, gates of Downing Street. Some of them wanting to voice support, others wanting to voice displeasure at uh, what they see as Mr Cameron's record in government. And on past the uh, Scotland office and then uh, Horse Guards, the Horse Guards building there on the left, beyond it Horse Guards Parade, where Mr Cameron has attended Trooping the Colour for the last six years as Prime Minister uh, in June. And then up towards Trafalgar Square, ready for the uh, great sweep under Admiralty Arch, and then down along the Mall, the great processional route which leads directly down to Buckingham Palace. Lord Nelson surveying the scene in Trafalgar Square. And then a left turn under Admiralty Arch, which these days is privately owned, but was, of course, from 1912, a very grand part of the government property portfolio in central London. Making their way now slowly down the Mall, with uh, Buckingham Palace directly ahead. They go down switching lanes, as is the Prime Minister's right, along towards Buckingham Palace. Vicky Young is still with me, our chief political correspondent. And just a quick thought, Vicky, at this point on the nature of the Prime Minister's statement here in Downing Street. I think there must be a part of him really wondering how this happened, how it happened so quickly that he's leaving here in the way that he didn't want to leave because of that vote on the European Union. But he will want to make sure that his legacy stands, that it is more than just that Brexit vote, talking about those in society who don't have as much as others, talking very much on a personal level about employment, about saying they're not statistics, these are people uh, who have jobs, how he'd wanted to help them, talking about gay marriage and about equality. These are the things he wants to be remembered for, not that Brexit vote. We'll talk a little more about Mr Cameron's statement later, but they're heading towards the palace. They're crossing um, the uh, 
side of St James's Park there. And uh, my colleague Sophie is at Buckingham Palace for us to look at the arrivals there. Indeed, the Prime Ministerial cavalcade just arriving here at the Victoria Memorial. It is just a short drive to Buckingham Palace from Downing Street. The Prime Minister, his wife Samantha, and their three children in a separate vehicle arriving here at the gates of Buckingham Palace. David Cameron, who arrived in Downing Street at just the age of 43, the youngest Prime Minister for almost 200 years, now becoming the youngest to resign, the youngest since 1895. So they sweep across the forecourt at Buckingham Palace in to the inner quadrangle where they will be greeted by the Queen's equerry and a lady in waiting. I'm joined here as well by Hugo Vickers, who is the Royal Historian, and also by our Royal Correspondent, Nicholas Witchell. Talk us through what will happen now. You know, Sophie, I remember being there in the quadrangle six years and two months ago when he arrived to be appointed. There were no escort group, there were no motorcycles from the special escort group of the Metropolitan Police. He got stuck in the traffic. Here he is now with his wife and we think with uh, the children in the people carrier behind being greeted by uh, Wing Commander Sam Fletcher, the Queen's Equerry, who will escort the Prime Minister and the Prime Minister alone. The uh, Prime Minister's wife will be uh, greeted by a lady-in-waiting, Lady Philippa de Pass, and she will be taken into an ante-room while the serious business is done, while the Prime Minister, as he still is, goes in. And uh, the children there behind them. I think I'm right in saying this is the first time that we have ever seen Prime Minister's children come as the Prime Minister tenders his resignation? Yes, of course, we saw Gordon Brown leave with his children from Downing Street, but they didn't come to Buckingham Palace for the audience at which Mr Brown resigned. But the entire family going in, the first time really we have seen uh, the Cameron children in public, on public display, if one can use that word, uh, in this way. So now into the palace, uh, they will be taken up to the Queen's private audience room, where it will just be David Cameron and uh, Her Majesty the Queen, and he will tender his resignation. Once that has been done, uh, then certainly Mrs Cameron and I would imagine the three children, Nancy, Elwyn and Florence, will also be invited into the audience room uh, to spend perhaps just a few minutes with the Queen as she talks about, well, what will they talk about? We yes. never know. We but never know. What are their plans now? I mean, uh, Hugo, you know more about this sort of thing than, than perhaps uh, uh, many people. But it is. It's remarkable. It remains terribly private, doesn't it? It, it does. And I think that's the, the great advantage of having a, 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 a constitutional head of state like the Queen. Um, the Prime Minister, the departing Prime Minister, they can chat away happily with each other. And it is private. And perhaps that's the only person to whom a Prime Minister can un unburden themselves of all their various problems and so forth with the sure knowledge that it won't go any further. Occasionally, of course, Prime Ministers write their memoirs and they tell us uh, that they got on particularly well with the Queen. We'll have to take their word for it because we certainly don't ever hear it from the Queen But herself. David Cameron did speak just last year, I think it was, about his the audience that he has with the Queen and how he finds it almost like therapy. He, he was able to talk to her about things he couldn't talk to anybody else about. Yes, and he's not alone in that. I mean, I think that is the great advantage um, because, of course, the Queen has been seeing state papers for 64 years and um, David Cameron was only born in 1966. I mean, the Queen had already been on the throne for 30, 14 years before David Cameron was even born. So imagine the experience that she has. You know, uh, I think that is the most fascinating aspect of it. When the uh, Prime Minister, if he gives her formal advice, she will take it. But if she advises him, he doesn't have to do it, but he'd, he'd do very well to listen. And the weekly audiences which take place every Wednesday when Parliament is sitting, I mean, we don't even know how long they go on for, but presumably the Queen, the monarch, does get to know her Prime Ministers fairly well in that time. Yes, she does. And I think also the, the fact that she will ask them various questions means to say that they have to be sort of really up to speed with what's been happening since the last audience. And so I, I imagine that that helps to focus, you know, what they really want to say because they've only got a limited period of time. And it's a bit like reporting to the headmistress, if you like, as to what's been going on. I would be very surprised, you know, if the Queen hadn't been watching on television the statement that the Prime Minister made in Downing Street. And putting aside all political considerations, it was quite a poignant moment to see the Prime Minister uh, declaring his love for his wife, uh, praising her for the support that she has given him throughout his Prime Ministership, and seeing the three children there, and what must they have made of the ranks of photographers there and the attention which they don't normally see. Because they've firsthand. very much been kept out of the limelight Absolutely. during this whole six years. Yes, and, and we in the media would always uh, uh, make a point of not identifying them 
because that's our obligation. But on this occasion, as Gordon Brown did when he departed from Downing Street, there was the family tableau uh, of them all making their way with the children, with their mother and their father to Downing Street. I don't suppose necessarily the children have met the Queen before. They see their father going off every Wednesday evening to see the Queen. They must hear him very discreetly, I'm sure, talking about the Queen. But uh, there they are, all now inside Buckingham Palace for this audience, this family group, but of course with this huge constitutional significance. This is the moment when David Cameron is resigning. And he tenders his resignation, Hugo, but he also advises the Queen to appoint Theresa May as the next Prime Minister. Well, yes, and when Theresa May gets there, what the Queen will be asking her is, you know, are you in a position to form an administration? Well, we know the answer to that. She is indeed in that position. Uh, interestingly, uh, many, many years ago, when Harold Macmillan took over after the Suez Crisis, uh, he told the Queen, uh, I might only last six weeks. And he revealed later that six years later, she reminded him of that, of that remark that he'd made all those years ago. But this is a very big constitutional moment, clearly. Oh, it is. But yes. the Queen's role in this, I mean, she's very much, it, she has yes. no role in who will be the next Prime Minister, but that wasn't always the case. No, in the early days, part of the reign, the royal prerogative was such that if there was any doubt about a Prime Minister, she would take soundings from various sort of grandees of the party, people like Marcus of Salisbury and so forth, and take advice as to who she should call. Now, of course, they've, they've changed all that, and, and it's all absolutely arranged by the, by the party and indeed by the you know, by the, by the members of Parliament and also sometimes if, if Theresa May had had this election, you know, it would have been the members of the Conservative Party out in the country who would have decided who the next leader was and so forth. So the Queen is, but the Queen is a very important part of the Constitution. There are three elements. There's the elected House of Commons. There's the House of Lords, which is in, in a way the, the chamber which tidies up the legislation and they are not elected. And then there's the Queen who is there by hereditary right. But no bill becomes an act of Parliament until she finally signs it. So in other words, Nothing, nothing can actually happen until it reaches her, which means a lot of people see it along the way. The palace realised that the monarchy was in danger of damaging itself in both 1957 and 1963, when the monarch, the Queen, was to some extent involved in choosing who the next Prime Minister was going to be. Now, I thought it was interesting that David Cameron said that he would resign and then he would tender his advice to the Queen that she call upon mm. Theresa May. I mean, strictly speaking, once he has resigned as Prime Minister, his advice counts for nothing because it's not advice with a capital A which the monarch must follow and it is one of the areas uh, on which the Prime Minister is disallowed really to offer advice because it is one of those very few circumstances in which an outgoing Prime Minister may have a, a, a motive in offering advice which may not necessarily be in the best interests of the country. It is perfectly clear on this occasion who the Queen will send for. In fact that person has already been sent for. Theresa May even now will be waiting, you know, with, the with her chauffeur. Will be idling. Yes, the Absolutely. chauffeur with the engines uh, prepared to scoot up here with her husband as soon as, or almost as soon as uh, David Cameron has left. But yes, it is very clear on this occasion who is to take over, and very shortly, um, because I noticed that uh, the Camerons arrived at Buckingham Palace at nine minutes to five, so we're about eight minutes into uh, their attendance at Buckingham Palace. Uh, very shortly they will be leaving. I don't think we're going to see the changeover of cars, you know, which on some occasions in the past there was that uh, the, the security, outgoing for example, Prime Minister leaves behind his Prime Ministerial limousine. Uh, I would imagine that he will leave in the same vehicle. I don't know. We'll have to see. Uh, because clearly in, in these times, outgoing Prime Ministers continue to have considerable security, just as an incoming Home Secretary uh, will have had the security apparatus around her, and most particularly in these recent days when it was clear that she was about to become Prime Minister. So, but in terms of 